this is Mr. Hammond Meyer, and I'd like to talk briefly about food and food issues in Lecture 10. So there is a mystery of the week. I will send you a link to a PowerPoint that has all of the questions and some pictures on it. It's a bird. I'll ask you to identify it. Now, overview questions for this particular lecture deal with what is food security, how serious is malnutrition and overnutrition, um, uh, how is the world's food produced, um, uh, what's happening to the soils relative to that, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the green revolution, and the effects of producing food on the environment, and the gene revolution, um, and can we produce more meat, fish, and shellfish? And how do we protect our res food resources against pests? All right, the first question that I'd like to talk about is um, the case of vitamin A deficiency. So golden rice is a genetically modified um, rice that has car beta carotene in it, um, which theoretically can be an inexpensive supply of vitamin A. So here is regular rice, here is golden rice. You can see how it's modified and it does have the beta carotene gene in it. Here's the problem. Vitamin A deficiency kills up to 670,000 children under the age of five every year. Um, what is vitamin A and what's it used for? Well, it's required for the formation of rhodopsin, which is in fact a photopigment in your retina. So you can imagine that vitamin A deficiency is gonna lead to blindness and possibly issues associated with that. It also helps maintain epithelial tissue that's in your skin um, and lysosome stability. Major sources include fish, liver oils, um, uh, egg yolks, butter, and fortified dairy products. Beta carotene um, and other provitamin carotenoids are in green vegetables, yellow vegetables, and especially in carrots and sweet potatoes. Okay, so brightly colored fruits have carotene in them, and theoretically our body can convert those carotenoids into vitamin A. Okay, the liver stores most of the vitamin A precursors in your body. All right, so this is from, that's from the Merck Manual. So here's the issue. Critics, many people say, why should we release a genetically modified rice into the environment when there are other sources? Um, uh, we could, in fact, um, uh, convert other things into vitamin A. Uh, for example, if we had more sweet potatoes in the diet, that might cover it, or more carrots, or more leafy green vegetables. And so where is this a problem? It's a problem in parts of the world that are very heavily dependent on rice as part of their diet. Um, and so vitamin A deficiency, VAD, 190 million children and pregnant women, most of the cases are associated with blindness, and now it is supplemented orally. So you can go to the to GNC and buy vitamin A tablets, and it's in most of the vitamins, but um, uh, it has been a historical problem in the world for quite a while, since 2002. So so we're at this impasse. Should we use genetically modified foods or should we continue to spend money to buy vitamins for people around the world to get rid of this problem? Um, uh, Greenpeace would argue that you should not release this gene into the wild because it's going to mix with other rices and other grasses and spread and could cause some unknown and unforeseen consequences. Bio um, uh, Syngenta has offered to provide rice seeds for um, anybody who makes less than $10,000 a year for farmers in especially rice areas. And that would solve the problem because then they could harvest the rice and then reuse the rice seeds the next year. They wouldn't have to buy the seeds again and again. What do you think about that? Um, uh, that poses an ethical problem. Do we go with a genetically modified food or do we continue doing what we have been doing, which is giving people vitamin A supplements? I'll let you think on that one a bit. Okay, so what is global food security? Well, here's the problem. One in six people in developing countries 
cannot buy or grow enough food. In other words, if you live, when I lived in Africa, we knew there was food there, but we had took a while to get it. In other words, we had, in other words, we had to make a special trip, which was took all day to go to the grocery store. Um, uh, so one in six others cannot meet their basic needs. That would be undernutrition. And so what is food security? When you hear the term food security, what you really are meaning is, do you, are you secure where your next meal is? When you go home, do you know that there's going to be a frozen pizza in the freezer or some eggs to eat or something to eat? Are you secure that you'll have some food? All right. Um, uh, now, food security comes out in lots of different ways. For example, this woman has what's called goiter, and she has a vitamin or she has an iodine deficiency, which has um, allowed the enlargement of her thyroid gland. So here's her thyroid gland that's swollen because of a lack of iodine. You don't see this very often in the United States. Why? We iodine. We had this problem back in the 1800s. And they realized, oh, we could put iodine in salt and people would get enough iodine. But if you don't have iodized salt, um, this could be and is a problem in many parts of the world. In other parts of the world, for example, in Sudan, where there's been a civil war and unrest for a long time, food security is a major issue. And these guys are just out picking bugs, whatever bugs they can catch, um, is the only source of protein and energy they've got. Okay, so how do we reduce childhood deaths from hunger? Always, always, um, the number one is increased education for women. If we can educate females, these other things will fall in line. We can, if we educate women, then they'll make sure that their children get immunized. They will, that encourages breastfeeding. What's the advantage of encouraged long-term breastfeeding? Well, that you don't start your menstrual cycle as well if you're breastfeeding, so that delays the time before you get pregnant again if you don't have access to birth control or there's cultural taboos against it. Um, uh, we can also, the education can increase the vitamin A deficiency issues. Okay. So, here's a thought question. Um, uh, what do you think is the best way for the world to deal with the problem of vitamin A deficiency? All right. Now, on the other hand, some of us have the opposite problem of overnutrition. In a 2005 Boston University survey or study, they found that 60% of American adults were overweight and 33, a third of us, were obese. That was in 2005. Those numbers have not gotten any better despite um, Michelle Obama's campaign to help with childhood obesity and exercise and diet nutrition. I'm not sure that in the long run we've made much progress. Um, we spend 42 billion per year trying to lose weight. So in other words, gym memberships, um, exercise equipment, whatever. It would only take 24 billion to eliminate world hunger. Somehow there's a mismatch there. Now, um, uh, what, where does most of the world's food come from? Well, most of the calories that the world consumes come from wheat, rice, and corn. And um, fish and shellfish are important for those one billion people that live near the coast. But most human beings' calories come from those three grains. And all three of those are um, monocots, in other words, they're grasses, and they have been cultivated in different climates around the world and have become a major food source for, for all of us. Okay. How much food can we continue to produce? Well, there is 50, about 50% 50 of the land is not usable. It's either desert or it's flooded too often or it's just not very good use. We have 21% of the land in use and we have another 28. So we could maybe double our food production if we took all of the arable land and converted it into farms. 
that would be at the expense of lots of wildlife. What would our planet look like if every square inch of possible arable land was converted into farms? Not the planet we now know. Um, about 80% of the world's food is produced by industrialized agriculture. And we'll spend some time talking about industrialized agriculture a little bit later. But it does use lots of fossil fuel, lots of energy, lots of fertilizer, lots of um, pesticides. And um, it uses monoculture. So we're going to grow all corn in this field, all a particular type of corn, so that we can use the same pesticide to make sure that it doesn't hurt the corn. Greenhouses are increasingly being used, and plantations in the tropics are coming into their own in terms of a, as, um, for certain foods, such as coffee and sugar cane and bananas. Okay. So here is a map of the world, and notice the green is industrialized agriculture, and you see where there's lots of industrialized agriculture, and then where there is nomadic herding throughout the Sahara and parts of Asia, um, shifting cultivation is slash and burn agriculture, and that tends to be mostly in the tropics. I mentioned a minute ago that greenhouses were becoming an important source of food. Notice here's a picture of 1974 on the left of southern Spain. So this is the very tip of Spain uh, near Gibraltar. And notice how green it is. And in 2000 on the right, it is now not nearly as green because it is filled with greenhouses. Why would there be strong pressure on the southern tip of Spain to have so many greenhouses? Well, think about... Just up the road are the markets of Germany and France and Italy. And this is this one of the southernmost parts of this part of Europe. So therefore it gets lots of sun, warm temperatures. So they raise lots and lots of food that is then shipped off to market to Paris or to Berlin. Um, so it's quite profitable. Industrial food production in high input monoculture. So we raise lots and lots of soybeans and lots of corn. Well, where does most of that, do those soybeans and corn end up? Not necessarily in human beings, but more importantly in uh, livestock. So we feed it to the cows and the pigs, and we eat the cows and the pigs. That's not a very ecologically efficient way to do things, but it's economically quite acceptable. Okay, we'll skip through some of this. What that really means is, um, uh, currently, based on if we're using a plant-based diet, it takes about 10 units of fossil fuels to put one unit of energy on our table. So let's say the other night I sat down and had sweet corn for the first time this, this summer. So the sweet corn, I got however many calories, maybe 400 calories from the sweet corn. But it really took 10 times that much, or about 4,000 calories, to put that one ear of corn on my table. How long can we continue to go into a deficit of 10 to 1? The United States, um, about 17% of its um, economic output is, is agriculture. And notice where the industrialized agriculture goes. 4% to raise the crops, 2% to raise livestock, 6% for processing, and 5% for transport. So out of that 17%, 11% of it is just in getting the food from the farm to your table. We need to rethink that system. Okay. Um, there are, in the tropics, some other methods of agriculture besides high-input industrialized agriculture, such as polyvarietal intercropping and polyculture. And in this case, here you have corn growing with beans. The advantage is the beans are nitrogen fixing, adding nitrogen to the soil. The corn is <laughs> sucking it up. Corn is terrible at removing nitrogen from the soil. So there needs to be some way to replenish that. In North America, we would tend to just fertilize the heck out of it. In other parts of the world where fertilizer expensive, is expensive, this is a, is a much more efficient way. But here's the problem. You can't get on your tractor and harvest 
the corn because you'll kill all the beans. So what do you do? Pick the beans first and then harvest the corn? That's a possibility. But that's very labor intensive. Research has shown that polyculture, where you have more than one type of, of agricultural product growing in an area, is in fact more productive than monoculture. But it's also not as easy to manage. Okay, we'll come back to erosion a little bit later. All right, we do have a problem with erosion, though. Um, when you set up agriculture in large areas, look at what's the farm belt or the breadbasket of the United States is right here in the Midwest, Iowa, Illinois, um, North Dakota, South Dakota, and notice that's a serious concern with soil erosion. And most of that soil erosion is gully erosion, which is dumping all of that sediment into the Mississippi River and then dumping it out into the Gulf of Mexico. Notice where there's also strong agriculture throughout Europe. And here, the Sub-Sahara has a real problem with soil erosion. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail in just a minute. Okay. So if soil erodes faster than it forms, um, it takes about 500 years to make an inch of good soil. And you notice when we were walking around in the woods, there was lots of O horizon in the woods, but if we went out into a field, that O horizon would have been removed already, and um, just the A, which where is new soil coming from? It's coming from that O. Um, so we need to slow down the erosion problems to help keep the soil that we have. And about one-third of the world's um, land has lost some of its productivity because of um, drought and human activities. Now here is where this is a major problem. In Sub-Sahara, so here's the Sahara Desert, and that's a desert, and there's not very much soil there at all, but around the edges there are lots of human beings living here, and they are tending to farm it as a aggressively as they can, given the technology they have. But what's happening is that's causing very severe water loss of the soil and erosion of the soil, so that when it does rain, there's no covering on the soil, and it soil gets washed away, or wind blows it away. This is causing desertification, so the Sahara Desert is actually getting larger over time because of human activities there in that part of the world. And how does this work in arid places? So we have salinization. And what that really means is um, uh, when it rains, the rain takes some of the nutrients out, but then it evaporates, and the evaporation takes the water out, but leaves the salt that was in the soil behind. And what inevitably this leads to is a situation like this where the water has evaporated away and left the salt. Now, if you tried to plant something, notice there's lots of growth over here where salinization hasn't occurred, but over here, nothing can grow because the water has left all the salt behind, and it's too salty for the plants to grow. A couple of things we can do to help with that is conservation tillage, which doesn't turn the soil over every fall um, and put all the corn stalks underneath, just till once a year in the spring when you're ready to plant so you have more organic matter left in your soil. Um, the other thing we can do is contour plowing. So if we contour the slope of the hill is this way and you'll notice that the contours run parallel with the slope. And where there's a little gully they go uphill a little bit to hold the soil there as much as possible. Um, terracing is another um, process that's been used quite a bit in um, certainly in Asia. 